Recording is on. Kemeteka, Kemenkate, Nemis Chikawa Meme. How are you doing? Greetings to everybody today. Today I wanted to share a little bit about some of my work that I'm doing and the revitalization of the uh, Mexicano or Nahuatl uh, variant from Tuxpan, Jalisco. I want to share a little bit about what's referred to as a dialectology, different dialects within Nahuatl, uh, how they're similar, how they're, uh, how they're uh, grouped a little bit, just basically. Now, before we begin, a quick, uh, a quick word about the word dialect and its usage, how I'm going to be using it today. Now, the word dialect or dialecto is taken on a really uh, bad stigma in, in Mexico, in Mexico, for, because it's uh, it's being used uh, kind of in a derogatory way. Indigenous languages are referred to as dialectos, and European languages are referred to as idiomas or uh, lenguas. This is a very old tradition dating back to, you know, basically colonial times, and it's infected pretty much all of the uh, levels of society, Mexican society. Indigenous people even refer to the language as dialecto when speaking Spanish. However, this is changing and there's a big push now to give credit where credit's due, to recognize that indigenous languages are languages, not dialects, and they are in par with European languages. And in my opinion, better, but, but uh, that's just my opinion. Um, so, Indigenous languages are languages, not dialects. However, like any language, there are dialects within it. <clears throat> dialects are variations. Some people don't understand what it is a dialect. And they say, uh, you know, variant. They use other terms. So what is a language show? So a language is basically words and expressions used and understood by a large group of people. And it's a method of communication. Um, it's, it consists of words that are structured in a conventional way. Now you may say, well, that's also the definition more or less of a dialect. Dialect does all those things. And that's true. However, a dialect is a particular form of a language, which is peculiar to a specific region, a social group, or, um, you could say, a, maybe, a ethnic groups um we we can view this uh, this relationship between languages and dialects in this way look at the language as the parent and look at the dialects as the children you know they stem from this uh, this is a this is a i think this is a good way of looking at it now just because the dialects stem from uh, one language doesn't mean that they're all similar and some people try to argue that uh, certain dialects should not be called dialects they should be called languages because they are so different from the from let's say another dialect let's say we'll say Nahuatl dialect in uh, southern Veracruz and a Nahuatl dialect in a Guerrero maybe they are not they are not mutually intelligible they cannot understand each other so they should be termed Languages, not dialects. This is a debate people have. Um, we're not going to address that. For here, we're just going to refer to them as uh, different dialects of the language. And what I like to do is I like to use the term variantes or variants, right? I try to use that instead of the word dialects a lot because of the stigma attached to this term. However, a variant, it, it's not the same. It doesn't have the same meaning because a variant is a, well, what is a variant? A variant is basically um, using a different way of saying the same thing. Speakers may uh, change their pronunciation, their accent, uh, their word choice, lexicon, um, morphology, syntax, um, so there's a lot there's a lot of diversity, but they understand each other. That's the difference. So one community may say the word one way, the next 
other community may say it a little different, but they understand each other. It's very sim. Everything else is very similar. So this will be considered a variant. You know, like for example, um, in Tuxpan Nahuatl, we have two words for the word for female or woman. We have siwash and sowash. Sowash, siwash. Um, these are variants within the language, and we refer to them as free variants, meaning uh, you can use them either or, and they're both correct. So that's a slight difference. It's a little confusing, but hopefully I could be able to explain it a little bit more as we proceed. Now, let me see if I can share my screen here. And uh, show you a quick breakdown of some Nahuatl variants. Okay. All right, so here's a quick breakdown, brief, it's brief, and there's some um, differences. This is taken from Docking, her, from her work, 2003. She's a famed linguist, uh, now what linguist, she's a European, of, I don't know what, extraction. Um, so according to the Mexican government, there's 30 or more variants, varieties of now what? Some people say 62, some people say 30, some people say, you know, there's different numbers. The number's not important for this uh, demonstration, for this work here that we're going to be discussing. But I just wanted to show you briefly. The reason I want to show you this is because there's a lot of confusion about Nahuatl. And a lot of people say, um, you know, when they say things, they say, hey, well, in Nahuatl, we say this or it's said like this. Uh, but that's not true. That's only a half truth. Because whatever it is you're saying is only pertains to your variant, you know. So if I say um, in Nahuatl, we say so what for woman, this is only true for my variant and maybe a few others. But if we go to the Huasteca, they don't use that word. They will say see what, see what, right? So we have to be really careful when speaking about the language. And if you're, you know, a language teacher or language student, specify what variant you're speaking about. That way people know and they don't become like uh, Nazis where they go and like trying to correct everybody. Somebody did that to me before they said uh, he was a learning, he was not a Nahuatl speaker. He was uh, learning though. And he was learning a Huasteca variant and uh, I posted something about um, during the COVID epidemic during the height of it the wash your hands stay in the house I made one which one said uh, wash your hands and uh, here we use you have that one which is a which is a plural uh, possessive suffix but in 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 many regions such as the Huasteca, this is only used with animate objects only, not your hands, not your body parts. And he kind of made a comment like, like, wow, that's incorrect. I never heard of that, you know, some uneducated comment. So I had to explain to him, well, in, in, in our variant, we do say it like this, this is the way it's said. And, uh, there's a lot of differences. What What's true for one variant is not necessarily true for a second or third variant. So we have to be respectful of each other's variantes or variants, right? So we have Eastern, which includes the Huasteca and parts of Guerrero and Western. These are the two main branches. Why are they divided into East and West? Well, there's linguistic reasons, common usage of certain terms, um, uh, morphology, syntax, there's similarities within the language, within the grammar that causes uh, them to be classified as, uh, you know, more closely related, also historical reasons. But you'll see here that we have Guerrero and we have Guerrero also listed in uh, Central and it's also listed in Western. Same with Puebla. And so that shows you that the, the diversity 
you know, within within regions. Within Western Nahuatl, there's two main regions, Central Nahuatl and Western Peripheral Nahuatl. And you may say, well, why, why is that? Well, the historical reason is that all these Central varieties actually come from, originated in the West, and then migrated into the Central, where over time they changed from each other so much that um, they they have that division, but they're so they're still close enough related on some levels that we can classify them all as Western. And within the classical or so-called classical Nawa here, which is which I would say is like base, the base is a Western, but it has a large influence from, from Eastern. So in a way, it became like a um, a, a mixed to a certain degree. Yeah. So these are the ones, the ones we're concerned with today are the Western peripheral and mainly Michoacan and Jalisco who we're concerned with today. I, I had to add Jalisco and Colima because they, they didn't have it on their list here where I, uh, where I stole this little, this little example from. And that happens a lot. You know, we're overlooked a lot. And that's okay, but we're still here. You know, we're making a comeback slowly but surely. <clears throat> so um, here's the divisions. Now, I just want to point out that all these divisions as far as like states, you know, states are just, these are uh, colonial constructs, right? You know, cultural constructs, if you will. You know, they, they mean nothing when it comes to, to Nahuatl or languages. So when I say Jalisco Nahuatl, that doesn't really mean nothing because Jalisco is just, um, you know, a geographical location created by some, uh, you know, some Europeans and their descendants among us and agreed upon by many people, indigenous and, you know, others alike. But it's still, it's a cultural construct. And uh, languages don't really respect those boundaries, right? So here's a, here's the region we're concerned with, which is referred to as the Western Peripheral Nahuatl. And as you can see, it's made up of uh, Southern Durango, Nayarit, Zacatecas, parts of Zacatecas, Jalisco, Colima, and parts of coastal Michoacan. I've excluded uh, Guerrero, Guerrero and uh, Estado of Mexico, the Mexico state. So in Guerrero, there's two places and, it, and one in the state of Mexico, they're kind of close to each other. Uh, and those three areas are considered to be the Nahuatl spoken there or that was spoken there is considered to be uh, a variant closely related to Western peripheral Nahuatl. Um, the ones in Guerrero, it would seem that they were uh, brought there from other regions. Possibly they were uh, brought, the, the variant was brought there from uh, from Michoacan, according to the historical record, because those towns were not originally uh, Nahuatl speaking towns. And a similar situation occurred in the West, in Western peripheral Nahuatl. So um, now don't take it that I'm saying that all this region is Nahuatl. Or if your ancestors come from this region, you're Nahuatl. That's not true, and it shouldn't be looked upon like that. You have to understand that this region was one of the most linguistically diverse regions in all of Mexico. I can make an equation with uh, California, which is one of the most linguistically diverse areas in the United States. Um, In California, they have over 100 languages, I believe, with many variants of that lang of the languages. In Jalisco, we have many languages. And what's also unique, I find very interesting about Jalisco and the, the Western peripheral is that many of the communities were multilinguistic and um, made up of different language groups this is a uh, found you know to be true all the way to you know teotihuacan the ruins there they find evidence of different people from all over different languages living there and uh, so for instance great example of this is here number five here which is tuxpan one of the places we're going to be talking about at time of contact it was said there was three languages spoken there 
There was Tiam and Cochin, which are unclassified language, so we don't know what they were at this time. And there was Mexicano or Nahuatl from the region. Um, you know, later on, 50 years later, they only had Nahuatl and then they had Purepecha listed. Purepecha made, had made its inroads into this area uh, during the expansion of the Purepecha uh, or, or so-called Tarasco people when they tried to colonize. Well, they did colonize the region for a small period until we, uh, you know, we had to run them out of there. But uh, nevertheless, some people stayed and the language is or was made inroads into this area where I'm from is right next to this Tuxpan, a place called Tamusula. And we have recorded of about four or five different languages. And the place where I'm from in that, well, that region was kind of like a, a capital, I guess you could say, of this whole region. And um, so it was multilinguistic. And this, uh, this is this tradition of multiling, uh, being multilinguistic is, you know, still found within up here where we see the number one, which represents Mexicanero or Nahuatl from Southern Durango. Uh, within this communities here, there's about five or six different um, groups there, indigenous groups. Uh, there were Mexicaneros, the Wirikuta, or so-called Huichos, or Corras, there's a, a Tepe one, and um, there's another one. And in some of these places, they live together you know, two or three different language groups together. And a lot of them are, um, spoke each other's language. And even in Mexico, and in their ceremonies, they uh, they say a lot of their prayers and, and stuff in, in Tepehuan, right? Uh, a lot of their songs, but then the prayers are in maybe in Mexico, and or vice versa, because they're, that's how ingrained they were, you know, with each other. So this is a region we're going to be dealing with we're going to be dealing with three towns, San Andres Ixtlán, which is in Jalisco, and Tuxpan, which is in Jalisco, and Pumaro, Michoacán, which is in Michoacán, coast of Michoacán. So you can see San Andres and Tuxpan are basically 19 miles apart, very close. And then from Tuxpan to Pumaro, which is not a straight shot because the road doesn't go straight, it's 142 miles roughly. So in the straight shots, obviously shorter, but there's mountains and things that get in the way here. What we're going to see today is that these languages, uh, these three languages are very deeply, closely related. And uh, in my opinion, they, they make up one, one dialect with uh, variations within them. Uh, the variations have become more drastic due to colonization, but from the historical record, we know that uh, there was a variant of Nahuatl that was spoken, you know, actually two variants, primary variants that were spoken throughout this region from Jalisco, Colima, Michoacán, and coastal in uh, southern Durango, Nayari area. And they were all, uh, they were mutually intelligible. So we have these three, and we're going to talk about these three today. The reason I compare these languages is because of the work I'm doing to revitalize uh, now within our region, in southern Jalisco, which is where San Andres, Ixtlán, and Tuxpan is from. Uh, we have some recordings, you know, uh, audio, but for the most part, we only have a, a few written sources. So what you have to do in that case is you have to do uh, a comparative analysis, comparing what we have with the variants next to us. And then we have to try to fill in the gaps also, right? You can do this, this is called a, a reconstructive uh, linguistics, if you will. So for for prim our primary source is Tuxpan. So San Andres Ixtlán, we have a, one document from their a vocabulary. And this is pretty much the primary word list I'm using and everything else is just filled in. And uh, it was recorded in 1919 by uh, Eriola. He was a priest. He was also a linguist. 
uh, he recorded in 1919 all these words that we're going to go over. Now, the mythology of recording the languages, like as far as uh, how to record them, what letters to use, there was no unified way like there is today. So there's variations, you know, and if a person wasn't a native speaker and he just came and met, you know, with the group, obviously he's not going to record everything exactly correct. So because of that, you're going to see there's a lot of variation. We have to compare under uh, other closely related variants to come up to come to a conclusion to draw a picture. So in Tuxpan, we have the most work, Tuxpan Jalisco, and we have um, basically five different sources, including Areola. He went there also. And I cited them here with these initials. R stands for Rua Calva. He was a priest in in uh, Jalisco for 40 years in Tuxpan, and he's said to have uh, mastered the language. And uh, I have recordings of him speaking it Mexicano. The, his speech uh, does not reflect what he wrote or what we understood as he wrote, because he didn't really give a breakdown on what uh, the letters each stood for in his uh, in his grammar that he wrote, which is a small grammar. He was not a trained linguist, so there's tons of mistakes errors in, uh, in spelling, but we're able to understand them basically by comparing the other sources. Pomaro um, Michoacan, this is a work by Sicho, I'm citing here, and and here it is still the spoken language, it's pretty vibrant, and we're gonna see. And just to go over the other sources really quick, so we have CB, that stands for Campbell, this was recorded in 1962, this is audio recording, uh, which I've transcribed. Um, is two elderly native uh, speakers. So I, I put the most weight on them because on, the, on that source because they're indigenous informants. Rubalcalva was not an indigenous informant. He was a second language learner. These ones would be uh, first language learners. The second is Valinas. Valinas, who's a, a Mexican linguistic linguist, uh, but he's a trained linguist. And he went there and did his field work in the late 70s. And in 80s and everything he said lines up with the Campbell's work all the time. He explains a lot of, uh, you know, the inaccuracies with Rubacalva, which I don't even think he uh, reviewed. And then we have Johnson who in 1941 went through there. Johnson was a, a linguist and uh, he worked primarily with other languages, but he was a linguist and he recorded. And I would say Johnson was kind of like the bridge between Rubacalva and Valinas. And then we have Ariola, and then we have a few others like Yanis. Yanis, uh, she went there in the late uh, 1980s. She's like one of my heroes of uh, linguistics. She's a primary uh, prim primary expert on Jalisco Nahuatl from the colonial era. So those are our primary sources here. So what we do, what I do is uh, I try to verify every word. If there's variants recorded by different by different uh, investigators, you know the one that's the most common and the one that's verified by the related variants, that's the one I'm going to use in the reconstruction of of our of our of our variants. So, for example, um, San Andreas, uh, the word for um, shoulder is um, acos, right? And it's the same, more or less. We have the glottal stop there, Acoli, in uh, Barrubo Cabo. And then in Pomaro, it's changed a little bit. It's a Huasco, Huasco, right? Um, so we can see that this entry by Rubo Calvo is legitimate. It's a legitimate form. And it should probably be just understood as Acoli, as it is in, uh, as we see in the two other variants. Now here we have a Spanish, so what seems to be a Spanish word, right? And um, I always have trouble with that Spanish. Uh, but this is actually a hybrid because the o OA at the end, uh, when Nahuatl communities adopt Spanish words, Spanish verbs, they usually add this OA at the end. So, uh, that's a that's a Nahuatl um, verbal ending, and although it's I it, we don't have it recorded for a Tuxpan or Michoacan, 
it is recorded in 1795 by Cortes y Sedeño, who was an indigenous priest from the town of Tlajomulco up by Guadalajara and is one of our primary sources and probably the biggest source on the variant as it was spoken in that region, Tlajomulco. And he does record that. So it is a legitimate term. And he says that the way he's, the language he's recording was like basically like the lengua franca that's spoken throughout Jalisco. Jalisco. So everything is kind of a, that he's recorded, I've compared, and it's a, it pans out. So, for example, the word for water here is al, in San Andres Ixtlán, Michoacán is al, and in Tuxpan is al, al. So, Tuxpan has a unique position within the languages, and it has a devoiced l instead of just an l, right? So, this l we will refer to as a, de a voiced l, al, and then a devoiced l, al, al. And this is the common um, phoneme. However, Ruba Calva, he always writes a TL. This makes us to believe that, okay, well, it's at, at, right? Like in the central dialects. But this is not true. Ruba Calva, he writes this TL based for historical reasons. He's primarily copying uh, the method employed by Guerra in 1692, who wrote the first grammar. Jalisco uh, Nahuatl, and but Guerra, which I, I'm guessing Rubacalva did not read his introduction. He specifically states that in Jalisco, this sound does not exist, but that the TL that he's using it for just for stylistic purposes, I guess. But the what's pronounced is the L, and not the TL. However, in certain regions, they pronounce the T and not the L. So here he's she's showing us the two variants. If you pronounce the T or you pronounce the L, which is basically what we find here with um, in Michoacan, right? They pronounce only have L. I would not say only though, because we're going to see they have instances of a, of a T type uh, pronunciation. And then we have... Um, Al, the L, also in San Andres Ixtlán. So the TL. Now, does that mean that the TL is never present in, in, in Tuxpan Nahua? No, that's not. That does not mean that. Because due to different factors, colonization primarily, and the influence or, or the use of Nahuatl as a, a lengua franca and for uh, religious and government purposes, during the colonial era. So what do I mean by that? Well, during the colonial era, Nahuatl speakers from Central Mexico were brought into the region as a colonial force and sometimes, and their language was brought with them. It would mix in with other languages, other Nahuatl variants. We see this. For example, there's a, a good example is in up there in the Mexicanero area, they brought some Tlaxcalteca people there. And they had, in, in one community, there's a TL pronounced. And that's because that community is descended from the Tlaxcalteca, while the surrounding communities, they pronounce just the T, which is the indigenous variant from, you know, within the West. So in Tuxpan, we have a situation where there seems to have become an uh, influx of central Nahuatl speakers who influenced uh, the language in some way. Also, because Tuxpan was used as like a seat of power or control during the colonial area, um, there was scribes and the church. They would utilize, in the beginning, they utilized central Nahuatl variants to preach or to confess or to convert the indigenous people. Um, this resulted in many indigenous groups losing their language, some of them being replaced by Nahuatl, where Nahuatl was not originally their language. Um, but it also 
what happened was whenever there was issues with government or with the church, there was uh, scribes assigned to each town who would write the petitions or the letters to you know the governing persons, and they would do so in Nahuatl, and they would have to use a central variety. Um, so they would have to write everything with the TL, which is the primary difference. However, from the um, research, you can see that they didn't always follow that. So the um, vestiges of of, um, of their actual variant that they spoke, which is was a Western variant, well, would creep into the into the into the letters. So you would have words that were just totally not even used in Central Nawa. You use like paina, which to do something quickly or swiftly. Which in central no Isuka or Isuki, um, or they would use uh, L's instead of TL's, and so anytime we see a TL, we have to question it, its legitimacy. Now Valinas himself he tells us that the TL is cannot be utilized in Mexicano unless never at the beginning of a word or at the end of a word. So this is a violation. It can only be used at the beginning in monosyllabic words. So like the word for um, for uh, for no, which is kle, but maybe pronounced kle, but not as a strong kle, like found in Central Nawa, more of a softer one. The TL can be found in free variation within, within the, uh, the middle of a word, though. And so it's kind of a, you know, it's a puzzle. But we know that originally this TL uh, was not utilized within the area, within the area. So there's only two explanations for, for why that TL could be present today. And uh, I've already explained those. Now let's look at the next word here really quick. And I'm not going to go through all of these words, but I just wanted to show you guys a little bit. So the word for river here, real. It's two words here, and it's alakli and atlakli, atlakli, atlakli. You can see they're more or less both the same. One has a voice tail, one has a deep voice tail. Now this is recorded as the word for real, which is not, and probably was not the word for real, real or river because all of their sources in Tuxpan record this word as Atenco, Atenco. And it's also recorded in, um, in um, Michoacan. But, you know, a river and a stream are not very different, right? So Arroyo, which is like a stream, Ruva Calva, he records it as Atlautli, which we know should be a devoiced L, so it'd be a slouchy, which this UH is uh, sometimes pronounced as a C, and uh, or the global stop is sometimes pronounced sounds like a C to an untrained ear. So this a slouchy, a slouchy, or a lackly is uh, pretty consistent. Now the second example here, at Leo, he recorded it as at Leo, right? Obviously, this is a mixture of two words, rio and al, river. Now, in, in Nahua, and most all Nahua variants I'm uh, aware of, if a TL and an L come together, it just makes an L sound. So this would have to be made, the pronounced ajil and not at lio. This, this wouldn't really uh, make sense unless it was just, it was separated he has a separation mark, so we don't know. We haven't been able to verify that. But I would reconstruct it as al-shil, where the first al is water, the word for water that we have recorded by everybody here, and lio, which is a variant of rio, because or does not exist in, in Nahuatl. Traditionally, whenever they came into contact with the word that had the R phoneme, it would be pronounced as an L. So continuing, amo, amo, the same, no, 
Schle is a variant only found in Tuxpan. Well, not only found in Tuxpan. It's also found in San Andres Islan, which was uh, interesting for me. And we'll see why. Amonka, no I. This is made up from Amo and Onka to be. There is none, no I. Amo Onka. Amonka. We don't have it recorded where it's ran together as one word, although this is a common within uh, Western peripheral Nahuatl, especially in Tuxpan and uh, San Andres Ixtlán. We do have it as Amo Unca. So it's almost the same word, Amo Unca and Amo Unca. Amo Unca or Amo Unca in, um, in Tuxpan and Xle Unca. Xle Unca would have been the feminine form of saying this. Atemil is the same. Um, interesting. Ashkan in Ashan. San Andres Islan. This is for the word for now. In Tuxpan, we have it recorded as Ashkan and Aman. Aman or Amansi will be the feminine form. They make a distinction here. And Ashkan and Ashan. So they're the same in, in, in Michoacan and San Andres Islan. Now you're hearing me say feminine form and masculine form. And you're like, why? How? What does that mean? Well, with certain words in, in, uh, in Mexicano from Tuxpan, you have a feminine form that females would use and a masculine form that ma men would use. Like the words for yes and no, um, words for like what, today, uh, why, uh, not. And why is that? Well, right now we don't really know still investigating it. I have my suspicions though, based on a similar scenario that occurred in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the Caribbean where the, um, the Carib or Carib indigenous people moved onto the islands and basically conquered the, the Arawak speaking people. And I forgot the name of the island. I think it was St. Vincent. And what occurred was there became a distinction in speaking where the men spoke um, their language. And so like the sons would learn to speak uh, the Carib language and the women continued to speak because they were the ones that dominated, were dominated or conquered. They considered to speak their native uh, Arawak language. But over time, the children, both male and female, began to speak um, solely Air, Arawak, the variant of Arawak that they spoke, but heavily influenced by Carib. So I suspect a similar situation happened here with um, the arrival of the central Nahuatl speakers and the colonization of the area. We may have had uh, two groups that co-mingled and mingled and which we have a basically the creation of a mixed dialect, you know, two Nahuatl variants that mix. Similar situation was already recorded at the time of contact in uh, farther north by Guerra and Uva Calva, I mean, and uh, Cortez y Cedeno. Guerra in uh, 1692, which is our oldest grammar on the language, he states that within the communities, some communities would say al for water, some would say at within the same community, which shows a, 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 a mixture of, of two variants. Because another thing too that makes me believe this is because Ashkan is recorded as being primarily a characteristic of, of a Western and Central Nahuatl, while Aman is uh, usually used in the Eastern Nahuatl. And Eastern now also has uh, the TL variant. So if, if uh, individuals, warriors or colonizers from that area were brought during the colonial times, and I don't mean colonizers like in a bad way, but you know, it is what it is during that time. Um, they were brought into our area. You know, this could be a, an explanation for why the, the variant has those mixed. Ashkan Kema, 
This is recorded by Rubo Calva and by by uh, Ariolo for San Andreas Ixtlán. And uh, this is a very important term, Ashkankema, for all of us um, indigenous people from Western uh, peripheral because this was like a war cry during the Guerra the Chichimeca and the Mishtong War, and the, which was farther uh, in central north and northern Jalisco and Zacatecas and all that area up there where the so-called Chichimeca tribes and people were. Many of them were uh, Nahuatl speakers, like the Kashkane people, and uh, many of the people also just spoke it as a you know second language or lingua franca. But this was one of these words that they used as a war cry, Ashkankema, Ashkankema, uh, which means, you know, like, right now, let's do it. Ahora sí, this is a translation, more modern, but it's recorded in, you know, still was recorded all the way up to, you know, 20th century. And it's recorded in Michoacán too, but I just couldn't find the my citation, so I just didn't put it on there, on there. <clears throat> uh, let's go down farther. So we have verbs. They're all the same. Kawa, 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 kawa. This should be kawa, nakua. That was a typo. Um, kamak, the word for mouth. Kamak, kamak. And here we have kamash with the devoiced L, right? Ruvakalva writes it with the TL. So this is another example we're going to see. Numerous example where he puts a TL where in a, it's, it, there shouldn't be. And uh, you'll see here in a minute because some people may even argue, well, that could possibly be, but it's not. Though we have a variant for den for mouth also, within the, which is common within many. But den does literally means this edge. Uh, with campa, campa, but in Michoacan it's been changed to capa, capa and capic. However, this change is very old because Ruvacal, uh, Cortez y Cedeño in 1792 also recorded the same capa and capi variation all the way in Tlajumulco up, up towards uh, Guadalajara. So it's, a, it's an old change. Now, this is a good example of how we uh, use comparative linguistics or to come to verify a term. So... The word sequistly is recorded for uh, the cold, right? Yet, Rubacalva writes it de tequist, tequist. Well, it's not a D, it's obviously a typo. And it's a typo because, well, we have sewa, sisique, by valinius, meaning to be cold, a verb. And then Rubacalva also has sequits, sequis, right? And the Z and C are just are so are all they are is a you know spelling conventions different spelling conventions. I could also write it as an S, as as, as done in modern Michoacan now for sequisli. So here we have sequisli. Sequisli they use a longer verbal noun, longer form. So we know that the form should actually be sequis with the variant of sequis, sequis. Uh, chicha, the numbers are almost all the same. Chiwa, the verb, chikiwi. Now in chikiwi, chikiwi for chikiwite, but all in uh, Tuxpan, they only have the chikiwite surviving, right? That's common word in all, in Mexican Spanish in general. So we can safely assume though that chikiwi Chiquiwi would be the original form. Uh, coal, culebra, and then in Michoacán we have cual and cual, which we have four different basically spellings recorded for Tuxpan. Cual, or possibly it could be read cual, cual, cuat, by Johnson and cual by Valinius. So we can we have to come to a conclusion here, which more than likely, just like here in Michoacan, there was two forms. There was the long form, which would be here recorded by Johnson, Kualsh, and the short form, 
here recorded by Valinius. Quaj. And this is a common characteristic of Western peripheral Nawa is they like to shorten or uh, conjugate words, especially in Michoacan and Southern Jalisco. So we have like words like this. Then we move down here and I'll show you an example for the word uh, tree. The long form of the word is guawi, right? It's recorded by all three. Guawi, 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 with a deep voice tail, right? Except Felinius also has it with just a voice tail. But in Michoacan, they also say cual, cual, tree. This is a short, condensed form. And we found these short forms also. And we could kind of see the process of how this was formed. So cual became cuil, became cual, where everything just gets condensed. And here, the shortest form that I found by Johnson, cuel, 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 cuel. So I did basically comparing these and the greetings are even the same in San Andres Ixtlán and Tuxpan. So here's a response, uh, ¿Cuál canemotlanesi? ¿Cuál canemotlanesi? So the greeting is canemotlanesi. And, and the greeting in Tuxpan is quemetetlanes o quemetetlanes o quemetlanes. And it's also in, 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 in Michoacan, which I forgot to put right here, it's Kinami. Uh, Lanesi. Lanesi. Kinami and Lanesi, which are all the same. Kinamo is just a variant of Kinami. And Kemi is a truncated variant of the word Kinami. And Tlanesi, Tlanes, this is a credit past tense form. And Lanesic is also a past tense form. Another interesting word that I have here, and then I'm going to kind of wrap it up, is the word for lizard, which here we have it as, uh, it was reported in San Andreas as uh, Quichi or Quichi. And in Michoacan, as Quishi, with the N at the end. And then in and, and Tuxpan, as Kurishi. You can see that they're all three are the same form. This is These are just variants of one form. Um, this, this is the word, uh, I think, is kind of specific to the region for lizard. We have lots of words like that that are only primarily used just within the region. This is how we determine that they're, you know, they make up a language family with them, or a dialect, dialectical family, Kurishin. And why it has an R here instead of a Kui, you know, that's a longer explanation. But they're all they're all similar here. Now, Kuichi and Kuishi. Within Western peripheral Nahuatl, these two, the Quichi, Quichi, are almost interchangeable. But what is recorded, often recorded as a she, in many places is not always a true she or sh sound. It's actually between a ch ch and a sh she. So it's Quichi like a mixture of the two. And this is why you find it so prevalent. It's actually a mystery mix, uh, mixture of the two. And it has a variant within it where you can have it just a simple S. Instead of having a she, that she becomes just an S like we find here in Kostik, which is also sometimes recorded as Kostik. But it's here it's between an e, she and an S. It's not a true or S. But uh, basically, this is what we do, or this is what I do. I look for uh, to try to verify or validate terms and come out to the best uh, possible con conclusion because we have a lot of holes, you know, in uh, Tuxpan Nahuatl and 
San Andres Islan and a couple other vocabularies that we have for Southern Jalisco the re reconstruction of our, our variant, uh, there's holes. So how do we fill those holes? We can reconstruct the words or verbs and which is doable once you understand the language to a high degree and we can utilize modern variants like um, Michoacan, which are originally from our area anyways, as a, um, as a, you know, to fill in the gaps. Now we have to realize that there's differences uh, due to the isolation of the, of the dialects, you know, which were originally connected, but slowly became like little islands within the greater body of Spanish speakers. But here's a good example, like the word for, uh, you know, Oaxalote is bicho, bicho. You know, and this is kind of a, not a common term, bicho. Uh, but this is a term that's been adopted or used within the, within a, but for, for the most part, I would say 98% of all the terms that I went through here have turned out to be the same. Have turned out to be the same, which in, which is each, each one. And uh, I'm trying to find one. And sometimes there's differences though, like which are surprising because like the word for for fire in all the variants within wet the West, it's always is either something similar to uh the shushli, the shushli, or le shushi, something like this, a variant of this term. And in and in central now is uh it was like tle, Tlesochit, tlesochit, like a fly, fire flower, tlesochit, shochit, something like that. I can't remember the exact pronunciation, but they also had this variant. But the primary word in Central Nahua for fire was tlet, tlet, which, you know, Ruva Calvo obviously puts his little TL there, tlet, but it's actually hlil or hlel as reported by all everybody else except. Now, what's interesting though is remember. One of the characteristics of Western now is the lack of a TL, right? So you either have an L or a T. In Michoacan, 99% of the time it's L. But here we have an example where we have a T. T, the original embed for this word is, is a tle, right? Tlet, which later became other way around you could say it's a variant even it's click which then became Li, which then became Li, with a variant of li le we find it san this is how we can reconstruct the words but to have a t instead of an l is kind of rare in the trocan but it happens, it happens a lot. Not a lot, but it happens. And sometimes that T is recognized as a D, like a D sound now. And it seems like, you know, obviously in, in Tuxpan it was, it was sometimes mi more mixed because we have like this word here for black, Lili, Lile, and then uh, in, in San Andreas, Lili, in, um, or Liltic, Lily or Lily, the word Lily like has become to mean like Diablo in Michoacan, and they just Lily, but Lily originally meant just like a black uh, ink. But in in um, Tuxpa, they don't say Lily, it's Tiltic, Tiltic, Tiltic. But that's what Rubacalva, so he has it here clearly, Rubacalva, but then he says Tiltic, which makes no sense because they both come from the same. Balinia says Tili, but then Ariel Ola says Hil with an L. So you can see that these are two different variants um, coming together or just two different forms that are found in free variation. Uh, verbs are almost all the same. Everything's just really cool. What I, Also, so the word for Magay, which is usually found as Met, which Rubo Calva tries to say that's the term, right? But then later on, he agrees with Ariola and says the term is mezcal. 
the term in Western now for maguey is usually not met. It's always mezcal or mezcal. So mes or mesh. The E to I found recorded by Valinius Mish. This is a common. This is just a variant. It's, it's a free variant, in fact. So I could say um, mishkal, or I could say mezcal. And this is where we get the word mezcal. And mezcal originates in in, um, in in Colima. Mezcal originates in Colima. And I know a lot of places are really famous for mezcal, like Oaxaca. But it originates in this in this area, according to the um, all the research I've, I've done on it. And the, and the latest uh, research that I've uh, I've read, just like tequila, you know, and uh, there's a big debate if uh, mezcal was uh, being produced prior to Europeans' arrival. Some people try to credit credit it to the uh, Filipino workers that came and uh and uh, mixed in with the population, with our population in uh, in Colima. But there, there seems to be uh, a lot of archaeological evidence that they were actually distilling mezcal prior to European contact. Another interesting, and then I'm going to end it, is, uh, oh wait, one more, then I'm going to end it. So the word for cat, which is mishton, right? This is the common mishto, mishton, in almost every variant. So it's reported by Ruba Calva and San Andres Islam, but then... In the audio by the the elderly native speakers, they said "donchi, donchi," and I was like, "What does this mean? What does this mean? Where does this word come from?" Because it sounds so, and it was verified. It's a legit term because in Pumaro, Michoacan, it was also reported. So I asked uh, Magnus Farrell, one of my friends, linguist, and he would and he. Said, well, it's probably from Mishtonsi, Mishtonsi, which is a diminutive form, like little cat, right? With the scene suffix. In which case, it then became Donsin, uh, Donsin, Donsin, and then became Donchin or Donchin, right? And this makes perfect sense because in the Western in Nahuatl, especially in Tuxpan, the diminutive or reverential suffix seen is often found as chin or chi. So instead of tepetonchi, something small, instead of saying tepetonsi, tepetonchi, but it's not found for all. And in some other places up like towards Mezcala, they say nanche instead of nancy. So this this that made perfect sense, and it's also found as a variant diminutive in certain words in Michoacan. So the last word is we're gonna look for here is gonna be the word for a day or sun. Let me go to it. All right, here it is. Tonali. Tonali is the word for sun that we have in this region. Although Cortez and Cedeno also recorded the word tonati. Not tonatiu, not tonatiu, tonati, tonati, with a um, with a voice fricative at the end there, hey, like kind of like the Spanish J, but not as strong. Similar to what how they pronounce it in uh, other regions, tonati. This word, this form is also recorded in uh, Mexicanero, but they also use tonali. So tonali is the original form here in the West. Tonali for sun which is recorded in San Andreas, and it's recorded in, in uh, Michoacan. But here we have Ruba Calva, who wrote Tonat, with the TL. But in no variant is this TL, this Tonali found, Tonat. You cannot spell it like that. It's not pronounced like that. So what's going on here? Well, there's two things. He's just trying to use, he's copying Guerra, and using TL wherever a L should be found, a T should be found, or a TL. Three in different instances. But he's not telling us that it's only the L is pronounced. So it's obviously it's only tonal. Every writer, investigator, 
and every variant that I'm aware of says tonal, tonal or tonali. So this is just a good example of how we have to verify because somebody will get Rubacal's book, which he wrote in 1965 as an untrained linguist. And they would think, oh, tonat. This is how you say it, tonat. But that that's just, no, that's that's 100% incorrect. So that's that's uh, the last one I'm going to share with you because uh, it's getting a little bit late. But as you can see, I did a lot more. Soquil, soquil, soquil. This is the word for uh, mud, which in central, it's a, it's a, usually it's a socket. But here we have quail, quail, or quail, and not kit, although uh, Rubacalva did record it as such. All three other three, well, somewhat recorded as such. All other three recorded as a quail, quail, or quail. Uh, which is an interesting variant. So it shows that these are all three are closely related. Uh, they have a similar, um, they're derived from a similar source. Well, that's it. For, uh, thank everybody. Hopefully um, that was a little bit interesting. That's what we're doing to try to revitalize uh, our variant here in uh, Jalisco. Um, be printing, uh, putting out the dictionary soon. I compiled all those sources and put them as one. Uh, so once I get that uh, proofread taken care of, hopefully it'll be uh, available for everybody and uh, obviously for free within the community. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, watching. Uh, think more that's it. Like, hit the like button for me. I appreciate it. Oh, and subscribe.